Hello, and welcome to our webcast, Adhesive Tips and Tricks Every Medical Packaging Engineer Should Know, sponsored by Oliver Healthcare Packaging and broadcast by UBM. I'm Daphne Allen, Executive Editor with Packaging Digest and Pharmaceutical and Medical Packaging News, and I am pleased to have you with us today. We have just a few announcements before we begin. Our webinar is designed to be interactive. The dock of widgets at the bottom of your screen will allow you to learn about today's speakers, download resources, share this webinar via social media outlets, and participate in the Q&A session that takes place at the end of our presentation. The slides will also advance automatically throughout the event. You may download a copy of the slides via the resources widget. Toward the end of our webinar, we will ask you to complete our survey found on the right-hand side of your screen. Please take a minute to fill this out before leaving us today, as your feedback will provide us with valuable information on how we can improve future events. Lastly, if you are experiencing any technical problems, please click the Help widget found at the bottom of your screen, or type your issue into the Q&A area, and we will be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. Now, on to the presentation, Adhesive Tips and Tricks Every Medical Packaging Engineer Should Know. Our speakers today are Kevin Zacharias, Technical Director, and Rick Brady, Technology Manager, both with Oliver Healthcare Packaging. After their presentations, Kevin and Rick will be available to answer your questions. Now I welcome Kevin. Thanks, Daphne. Uh, just to kind of lay the foundation for today's presentation, I wanted to go over a few things. Um, really what we're going to be fo focusing on today is adhesive formulation, adhesive coating processes, heat sealing guidelines, and risk mitigation tips. And the adhesives we're going to be talking about pertain to both water-based or air knife coating, as well as hot melt or gravure coatings that are commonly applied to substrates like DuPont, Tyvek, paper, and films. And they're used to create peelable seals for the sterile barrier systems that are commonly used for medical device and pharmaceutical packaging. So on this slide three, you can see under magnification those two different coating technologies depicted. Um, these adhesives also are there for um, visual evidence of the seal integrity, and they all need heat to make them work. And they're formulated for applications such as sterilization modes. So think about different formulations for autoclave or steam, high heat sterilization modes versus ethylene oxide gas. Um, they're also sp um, specifically um, formulated for different processes like form fill seal versus uh, shuttle sealing on a tray or, or lid. And they're also formulated specifically for the materials that they're gonna be bonded to, such as difficult uh, materials like polypropylene. And they're also um, designed or formulated to have specific attributes like superior hot tack strength or creep resistance, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later in the presentation. So with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to Rick to talk about our formulation. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Hello, everyone. Um, we're gonna start with some basics on heat seal polymers. Uh, polymers can basically divide in, in general into thermoplastics and thermosets. Thermoplastics are um, things like polyethylene, polyethylene terephthalate, polypropylene, linear high molecular weight polymers where all the the chemistry is done ahead of time, basically. All the curing is done, all the polymerization is done ahead of, ahead of time. Thermosets, on the other hand, are uh, things like epoxies or super glue that uh, require chemical reaction, and these uh, materials then uh, cross-link and basically form an infinite network. Um, so for uh, heat seal packaging, uh, medical packaging, uh, we're really using thermoplastics, and there's some good reasons for it. Uh, first, they're high molecular weight, and all the reaction is, is done. There's uh, no residual monomer, so these materials are, are safe, and they, um, they're very low cytotoxicity, they have very low cytotoxicity. Um, because, also, because they, they, they're not reacting any further, uh, they're, that they're not curing, that means uh, they're not changing. So they have excellent shelf life. They uh, can sit there, a coated uh, um, pouch or, um, or lid can sit there for a long time without changing. 
And then uh, lastly, they, this um, thermal plastics can have very fast uh, sealing. And that's because all they're doing is they're not, they don't require time and temperature for cure. They only require a very short uh, time and temperature for melting and then flowing to make the seal. So thermoplastics is, is the, way, the way we go. Um, so here's a cycle. So thermoplastics are, it, it's a, really a reversible cycle. Um, you heat the material, it softens, and that softening is by uh, melting, basically, the crystal, crystal, crystals in the polymer, and then you uh, cool, and then the material hardens. And uh, for crystalline materials, that's re called recrystallization, and and uh, and that cycle can go round and round. So uh, a little bit more about thermoplastics. So they can be either semi-crystalline or amorphous. Um, we say semi-crystalline because polymers are because of their high molecular weight, it's uh, it's difficult to get perfect order in them, and so they don't fully crystallize. It's not like ice or things like sodium chloride. There's always regions of crystalline and amorphous regions. Um, so examples, again, are, would be polyethylene and polyethylene copolymers. The key material that we utilize is the, generally as the main uh, polymer uh, in our uh, formulations is ethylene vinyl acetate, um, and again, these these semi-crystal materials are flowing above the melting point. Um, and for amorphous materials, that means no crystallinity. Um, if you have enough of a co-monomer like vinyl acetate, if you get very high in vinyl acetate, you actually become you cause become an amorphous material, and no crystallinity uh, can occur. You disrupt the the chance for the polymer to order. In that case, the controlling temperature is the glass transition temperature, also called Tg, um, and that's really the temperature where the material turns from a, a, a glass or a hard polymer to a, a soft, flowable, um, tacky type material. Okay, so um, how do we uh, study these these things. Um, a key technique for us is DSC, differential scanning calorimetry, and basically it's a thermal method. And what you're really getting at is the material's phase transitions. Um, so those again would be melting and glass transition. And it turns out it's uh, very useful in formulating of both hot melt and water-based adhesives. So I'm going to show some examples of of what uh, the DSC results look like. Here's for a semi-crystalline material, and this is, uh, as you can see up in the top left, this is actually Tyvek, 1073B Tyvek. Um, and you can see that the, the melting point is very uh, clean and strong at about 130 degrees C. Um, it turns out that that uh, area under the curve, uh, which says 194 joules per gram, that's actually uh, can help you get at what the percent crystallinity is. Um, for polyethylene, the, the pure uh, crystal melting is about 293 joules per gram. So um, this is basically about a two-thirds crystalline, 66% crystallinity in, in a typical Tyvek. Um, so the thing is with, a, say, we have a coated Tyvek um, and we want to uh, be able to heat seal it, well, we really want the coating to uh, flow and be able to make the seal at a lower temperature than 130 C. So that's where the copolymerization comes in, where you put a co-monomer and it lowers the melting point. So in the next slide, you see that this is for an ethylene vinyl acetate copolymer. You see that the melting point is lowered down to about 71, 72. Uh, degree C, and if you look at the joules per gram, you'll see it's also uh, much less percent crystallinity. Um, now, I should caution that you're not going to get uh, really flow right at 72 degrees C because these are very high molecular weight polymers. They will soften and become tacky, but um, usually when we're heat sealing, our typical materials won't really start to make a seal more until more like around 100 C and then above. 
Um, so there's be, in addition to the transition, the melting transition, the other thing that's important always with polymers is molecular weight. Okay, and then moving on to an example of the morphous, and this is, as we talked about for the vinyl, uh, this is a vinyl acetate ethylene. If you get more than 50% vinyl acetate, um, you get uh, no crystallinity. And this step change that you see, it's not a peak anymore, it's a step change, and that shows the glass transition temperature. So this material is, is actually becoming tacky. Uh, at a very low temperature at about 10 degrees C. So obviously, um, you know, if you're going to use it um, because of that tack, you're going to, we use it in certain applica applications, you're going to need to add other things to sort of minimize that tackiness, and we'll talk more about anti-blocking and stuff in a couple of minutes. Okay, so um, now before we get into some of the details of formulating, uh, what it, what I really want to talk about, uh, make sure you understand first, is that we're formulating generally for a cohesive peel systems. So um, what that means is is shown here. Um, so if we have Tyvek on the top and a film, say a film on the bottom, and then we have our coating or adhesive in the middle, so we'd have, say, a coated Tyvek being sealed to that film, um, we formulate so that we get failure on peeling in the middle. Um, that So basically the adhesive layer is the weak point and we get split down the middle. So another show of that is down below for say a tray with a, with a Tyvek, coated Tyvek lid. As it peels, you leave some, you split the coating and you leave some on the, on the tray and that gives us what we call adhesive transfer. You can, that's that white white that you see that's good evidence that you made a good seal. Um, so, so what we're doing in all our formulations is really uh, controlling the cohesive failure. We want good enough, if we don't have enough, uh, we do need to formulate for good enough adhesion between uh, all the components, otherwise you get what would be shown on the left, the adhesive failure. Um, okay. so, Here's a video of, that shows this cohesive split. So this is actually a, this is, a, sorry, this is actually a, uh, it's a coated, it's a coated Tyvek on, on a PET-G substrate. And you can see that uh, if you look closely, there's, uh, adhesive that's left behind onto the PET G. So that's that's what we show on that on that video there. Okay, now for formulation in general, um, there's a we have, as Kevin talked about, two general types of of uh, heat seal materials: the hot melt, exhale hot melt, and the seal science water based. And the formulation is very uh, similar. There's a lot of general you know general similarities between them. Um, the key components for both are the polymers, and often this is EVA polymers like we talked about, and they're basically providing the strength. Um, but if you just had the, at the, had the polymers by themselves, um, they wouldn't either stick very well, or in some cases, depending what you're sticking to, it would be too strong, and you get what we call a weld seal, would not uh, be peelable. So what we do is add some other things, and waxes is a key component in both cases. Um, waxes are giving us control of the cohesive strength, so basically weakening the polymer uh, to make that the, the weak point for failure. And also waxes are, are going to help with anti-blocking, so make it so the, that you can roll, roll the material um, up on itself without sticking together. Uh, another thing we add is hydrocarbon resins, sometimes called tachifier resins, uh, and these materials help with providing specific adhesion uh, to different substrates, and you vary the resin based on what uh, substrate you're going to be sealing to, whether it be a forming web or, or PET-G, that kind of thing, tray material. Um, so the unique part of the seal science, of course, is that it comes uh, in water and uh, has water and surfactant. So those are the carriers that keep 
keep the dispersion all together. Um, uh, a specific on the hot melt that you have to watch for is because you're not uh, depositing from water, you do need to control with all these components the viscosity of the of the melt in order to get you know make your process work. Okay, now here's a big chart, and it's you know we're not going to go through it all, but um, basically shows you know how we can tailor make um, formulations for different properties and the things we have are the properties on the left, say ad adhesive strength, cohesive strength, that was, we talked about those already, adhesive transfer, that's the vis visual uh, appearance, the whitened appearance, hot tack, um, which is important in form fill seal applications, cold shock resistance, and then we also talked a little bit about anti-block. So for example, if you want to control co cohesive strength, uh, well if you put more wax in, then you have a down arrow. That means the cohesive strength is going down. Um, resin will also lower the cohesive strength. If you have more polymer, that will increase the cohesive strength. And uh, in some cases, we put filler, uh, and sometimes it's inorganic filler, uh, and that will also lower the cohesive strength. So that you can see you can use this chart to, to get where you want to go in formulations. Okay, let's uh, talk a little bit now. That's the former formulation generalities. Let's talk a little bit about the adhesive coating processes. So first, the hot melt, and here you can see the hot melt is there's there's molten material in the in the bottom there. That's the black envision in black, and we have an engraved roller. This is basically a gravure printing or gravure coating process. You have a doctor blade which takes off the excess hot melt and then it basically is printed onto the onto say Tyvek or paper or whatever substrate and you can see then it results in these you're basically printing small hot melt dots as you see in picture there on the right um, and uh, those just as uh, information those dots are generally in the 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 millimeters across so they're very small dots uh, can barely be seen with the with the naked eye. And here's a video that shows uh, the hot melt process uh, from the unwind and through um, the the coating process. So that's in the in the caged areas where the gear cylinder is and where you're actually doing the coating. And as the video goes on. It's hard to see, but you do have to go through over some chill rolls to cool down the polymers. So roll up. But it's relatively small equipment's relatively small because it, you know, you don't need a big draw. You're not drying anything off of it, um, it and uh, you're just basically melting the polymer and cooling it. Now for the air knife process, uh, that can be envisioned here where you have a, an applicator roller which dips into a pan full of water-based adhesive. So water-based adhesive basically think latex paint looks like a lot like a latex paint. Uh, that, that roller will pick up the material and uh, then deposit it onto the, the bottom of the web. And then in the blow-off pan, the air knife um, is, is a non-contact method that we use to meter off the excess coating. So you can control basically the coating weight through the pressure in the air knife. And that's blowing off the excess and then the coated web goes to the ovens for, for drying. And the next, um, the next slide shows in a broad way. We just talked about the lower left, which is the air knife section, but the, the coated web then goes through a, an oven where you dry off the water, basically, and um, heated oven so we control the drying conditions to, to get pro appropriate drying for for each each coated material. And then we get uh, on the dry end, we have the, have the coated roll finished finished up. And here's the here's the video. You can see the 
Aaronite section, also I can see it goes up to the other. Okay, um, so that's that's pretty much it on my end, and I'm going to pass it back to Kevin then. Thanks, Rick. So now that we've uh, listened to some great discussion from Rick on the chemistry behind the adhesives, how they work, how they're formulated, and also the coating processes involved with putting them on substrates, we're going to spend a, a few minutes talking about making a seal or the heat sealing process. So um, if you boil it down into uh, simplicity, it's, it's really, uh, as we've talked about, it's uh, the, the heat sealing process. So uh, it, it has to do with temperature and dwell and pressure. Uh, the slide 18, we're really highlighting that temperature is the most influential factor. It's the most important, has the greatest impact on sealing processes. At least that's what we have learned over the years. So if you look at a DOE or, or conducting DOE type of experimentation, um, temperature is typically the highest or most influential factor. Dwell time is there, um, has a, has, is probably the most secondary or the secondary influencing factor. Um, it's there to basically give the um, materials time, uh, time for the temperature to soak through the materials, activate and create a bond. But it's also important to know and realize that temperature and dwell time kind of work together. So in this slide, if you look at that, at that diagram, it's, it's a simplistic diagram of a sealing process You've got a heated platen, you've got your Tyvek lid, um, and you've got an adhesive layer, and then you've got the film that you're trying to seal or bond to. And it's kind of trying to depict that, you know, one second, two second, three second, four second, that dwell time is there to give you or give the materials time to soak um, or the, the temperature to soak through the materials, get that adhesive to activate. And Rick talked a lot about the chemistry behind that and the physics behind that, but get that adhesive to activate and then bond to the sealing film. So they work together. Um, it's also important, you can look at it from two different ways. Um, you can go with uh, high temperature and shorter dwell times to get to where you need to go. You can also go with uh, lower temperatures and longer dwell times to get to where you need to be. And we're going to talk about optimizing the sealing process in the next few slides. So but before we do that, let's talk about uh, pressure. Pressure, uh, in our experience, is um, the least influencing factor or has the smallest influence, um, but it's also misunderstood. It's, it's common for us when we're dealing with our customer base to find folks that are using pressure or overusing pressure. Um, uh, they're, they're cranking it up. The, the mindset is more pressure means you know, better. It's a more robust seal. That's typically not the case. So you have to be really careful with pressure and overdoing it. And also, it's, it's commonly used to cover up the sins of the sealing process. So if you've got a platen that's not level or, or uh, you know, you, you can use pressure to try to compensate for that, but that's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, when you hit too much pressure in a sealing system, you can get weird things to happen with the adhesive layer. Uh, you can get the adhesive to kind of squeegee out from the sides. Um, you can get that adhesive to go and be forced up into the fibers of the Tyvek or the paper, uh, and that can leave less at the interface which means um, you, know, you potentially have a less robust seal. So um, if you talk about optimizing your sealing process, I'm looking at slide 20 here, we have a simple seal curve. So that chart basically is depicting on the x-axis sealing temperature from 200 up to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And then on the y-axis, that's your output of seal strength in pounds per inch. So, you know, I, common advice we give folks when they're starting up or trying to um, validate or qualify new materials or a, a new sealing operation, you, know, you start low, trying to identify your low, low lows. Just be careful. Um, you know, in this, in this slide, it, you know, it's pretty, you're looking at the seal appearance. In the pictures, you can see kind of a spotty, um, blotchy looking seal. That's pretty obvious that you're, you're not fully optimized. You don't have the adhesive fully activated. So that's usually pretty obvious. Um, the peel strength is usually low in, in, in this part of the um, process as well. So you, know, you perhaps have values that are low, 
um, below what you think your requirements are, below the capabilities of the materials, or you have a lot of variation in that seal strength output. So starting on the low end, pretty obvious um, you're, you're not there. But you also, um, you know, a word of caution is that you can actually have a good-looking seal cosmetically, and we're talking about the adhesive transfer that Rick was discussing and the cohesive nature of the adhesive. So in this slide, you look at the picture, um, the adhesive transfer looks really good, no gaps, no voids, but you're not fully optimized because your seal strength is still variable or it's still low, so you just have to be aware and, and you have to look at multiple factors um, before deciding upon whether or not you're optimized. On the flip side, if you go to the high end, and, and in my experience, I think I see this uh, even more frequently with our customer base, um, you know, the human nature or the mentality often is, more is better, stronger is better. So it's pretty common to see folks that are um, overdoing it with their sealing process. They're in temperature ranges that are too high. Um, they're using too much pressure. Um, what happens in this range, you can get problems with material failure like you see in the pictures with um, things, substrates tearing or delaminating, and that's gonna inhibit the ability to present that device into an aseptic you know, aseptically, so that's a problem. You can get kind of splotchy looking seals like that lower picture, um, and you're, you're just too high. So that's not a good region to be in either. There's risk with that. So really it's all about, uh, slide 23 here is telling us, you know, this is where you want to be. You want to be in that sweet spot where you've got a nice flat seal curve, uh, whether you're at your low, low lows or your high, high highs, you're getting fairly consistent seal strength, and then you've got a good looking cosmetic seal, no gaps, no voids, and that's Really, at the end of the day, that's what it's all about, trying to identify that sweet spot. So that's the heat sealing process. Now we're going to um, look at risk, and we're going to talk about mitigation. So risk, that's not a very fun topic typically, but let's talk about it anyway. Um, I'm going to break it down into um, really at the end of the day, if you look at this slide 25, uh, and you think about heat sealing processes, I mean, all heat seal adhesives are going to be weaker at elevated temperatures. So that's the foundational thing to remember. Think of when you're trying to mitigate risk from your processes, um, think about um, areas where that adhesive combination, that, that package is at elevated temperatures. So a couple different areas to consider. Hot tack uh, in that first bullet point. Hot tack would relate to um, your sealing process right after the seal is made and that um, adhesive has not been afforded enough time to cool down and fully set up and get to full strength. So you can have problems um, if there's stress imparted on the seal in that type of time frame. So that would be a hot tack failure. You kind of can get scalped looks to your adhesive transfer like that top picture. Um, we'll talk more about that in a minute. And then um, the other thing we'll talk about is further downstream from your sealing process, uh, exposure to warm temperatures. So think about your ETO cycles. We all know there's um, elevated temperatures in that cycle. There's humidity, there's vacuum, there's pressure. Um, so we're going to talk about um, sterilizer creep. So that lower picture would depict a, a creep to failure problem that occurred in a, in a sterilizer where there was stress on the seal, again, at elevated temperature. So again, break it down to um, risk at elevated temperatures and think how to mitigate any stress on your sealing on your seals during times of exposure to elevated temperature. So we're gonna talk about hot tech first. Um, slide 26, uh, kind of a funny looking slide. We call it our bow tie test. It's somewhat of a homegrown test that we use, not as a pass fail criteria for our adhesives, but more for uh, ranking different adhesives, ranking different um, substrate combinations to understand um, how their hot tech characteristics work. So picture um, a piece of steel like in this picture that's shaped in a um, bow tie configuration. We're going we're gonna to create seals on a bar sealer in a lab setting, and we're going to fix either end of that sealed coupon to the ends of that bow tie and flex it, like the picture on the left there. And then we're going to pull it out of the bar sealer and immediately put stress on that seal. So it's going to kind of duplicate a hot tack failure or put, you know, kind of simulate what would happen in a hot tack scenario, and we've got some videos to share with that. So this video is, you'll see a bar sealer, and you're, you're going to see uh, the operator loading uh, some coated Tyvek. It's sealing it to some film with that bow tie attached. 
pulling it out of the seal uh, interface there, and you can see there's no real no separation or really no separation of the um, seal. It's maintaining its strength. So we would, in rough terms, look at that combination and say, hey, that's got some pretty good hot tack characteristics. Uh, didn't really need much time to set up, or it, it set up very quickly and came to strength. And despite having that bow tie putting stress on the seal, which we realize is not not real world, hopefully, um, is a way to depict or rank materials. So we're going to look at the next video, and you're going to see a completely different scenario. It's a different, different adhesive, different materials at play. Um, we're sealing it at appropriate sealing conditions, and you'll notice that as soon as the operator pulls the bow tie out of the out of the bar sealer, the materials come apart. So we would say, hey, this this combination has uh, not the best hot tack characteristics. But interestingly, um, the next video, we're going to depict the exact same um, the exact same material combination, same ceiling parameters, same bow tie, same operator. So everything's the same except one thing changed in this scenario, and you got a drastically different result. And you probably noticed it on the video. Um, it was the fact that the operator held the bow tie in place so it did not put stress on the seal. He waited about a, about one second, gave it one second time for it to set up, cool down, and you saw a drastically different scenario, and it maintained bond without separation. Um, so the, the message here is think about that in your processes. Um, think about putting in play some type of a delay after the sealing uh, process occurs. And I guess I'm thinking specifically about uh, form fill seal applications where you've got intermittent motion, you got the machine indexing. Um, so right after the seal is made, if you can program in a slight delay before the machine indexes forward, you know that's that's making your process more robust. Um, you know, think about scenarios where you've got something stuck to your seal platen and it and it creates a seal and then immediately pulls up on on your lid stock. That's a hot tack scenario. So that's why we really recommend people to, to put um, strong PMs in place to clean your seal tools on a regular basis and, and think about those types of areas where you can, where you, can you know, mitigate risk in your processes. Um, so, you know, the slide here is a chart um, which is depicting four different adhesive combinations using the same bow tie test. Um, the y-axis is the amount of seal that was retained after um, the sealing process. So um, the message here is that you know, different adhesives have different hot tack properties. And then on the x-axis, you've got your sealing temperature going from 105 up to 125, and you'll notice that several of those adhesives perform more poorly or have problems at that higher sealing um, temperature. So think about that, and that goes back to more is not always better. So um, it's kind of common sense to think of your sealing temperature when it's really higher at the threshold um, of high temperature. It's going to take longer to cool down and set up. So, you know, you could be making a hot tack scenario worse by having higher seal strengths or seal temperatures than needed. So just to wrap up hot tack, um, things to consider, which we've covered, you know, if you can do anything in your process to allow time for the seal to cool down before potential of stress on the seal, that's a great thing to do. Um, you want to optimize your sealing temperatures. More is not always better. We just talked about that. And, you know, not all adhesives and material substrates are equal. I mean, there's, you can have drastically different hot tack characteristics depending on the materials you're using and the adhesives you're using. So um, something to keep an eye on and consider when you're, when you're doing um, future qualifications. So switching from hot tack, we're going to talk about seal creep, and we're going to focus in on a, a couple things. But, but, again, the mindset here is elevated, elevated temperature plus stress on the seal is your problem problem area or your risk area. And so, you know, we're, we're talking about downstream from the sealing process. So it's fully set up. It's either, you know, the, the problem potentials are an EO or during transportation, which we talked about. Transportation could be um, tropical climates, et cetera. Your package is getting heated up. And then with, when you combine that with stress on the seal, there's a potential for a, for a problem or a seal creep issue. So stress on the seal could be something as simple as an undersized package. So a couple of these pictures depict that. But if you've got your product that's 
pushing up against your lid stock, um, that, that, that's a potential that you, know, you may get away with during validation, but downstream and over time you might see, um, you might see low occurrence rates of seal creep issues, and it could be a simple thing like your product is pushing on your, on your lid stock during EO or during warm climate transportation and, and causing creep open failures. So we have another somewhat of a uh, homegrown test, um, and this video is going to show that. Um, I'm going to try to describe what's going on in this, in this picture, but it's really taking a look at how strong are the adhesive combinations at elevated temperature. So this is, um, we're creating a seal, a coated substrate married up to a film. We're putting a 200 gram weight on one tail of that coupon, and then we're putting it in a, in a chamber at 55 C and we had a camera, a time-elapsed video running, kind of showing what's going on during that process. So we're putting excessive stress on the seal. We've got warm temperatures, 55C. We talked about adhesives getting weaker. And in that video, you saw the three products on the left, or the three samples on the left, failed at some point during that two-hour test. The three samples on the right maintained their bond strength um, through that process. So um, again, it's, it's about having a, an insurance policy and understanding the materials at play um, and their relative strength at, at elevated temperatures can be a, a big part of mitigating risk in your process. Um, and, and this chart on this slide is showing just what I'm talking about. It's basically the results of that creep test that we just saw the video of. And you've got six different adhesives that we've, that we've tested. Um, again, not a pass-fail scenario, just a way to rank. Um, you look at adhesives B and D. Um, Y-axis is time till failure. Well, those two um, over 120-minute test duration did not fail, did not, did not really move at all. They maintained their bond. You look at adhesive C, and in that test, it would have failed um, completely at around 30 minutes. So um, it's, just, it, it's just a way to, to think about your processes, think about the materials you're selecting for your, for your um, sterile barrier packaging systems, um, something to keep in mind. So we covered hot tech, we covered uh, creep. We're going to have a couple more slides here, just real world, real life case studies. I think um, these always help me to bring things home. So this first case study related to hot tech failures, and essentially what was going on, it was a horizontal form fill seal application with a flexible bottom web um, and a coated top web substrate. Um, the device manufacturer had been using this combination for many years successfully. They introduced a device and used the same materials, and this device happened to be much heavier weight than their current products that they were uh, producing. And over time, they started to notice some, some scalp looks in the seal like that top picture shows, um, and it really related to hot tack. So think about a really heavy device sitting in that web. As the machine is indexing, it's, it's sagging, it's pulling down the bottom web, um, if, you're, if you're familiar with form fill seal uh, processes. It's pulling down that formed cavity and creating um, stress on the seal immediately after the seal is made. And it was a, a low occurrence rate, but nonetheless, it showed itself periodically. So um, the, the solution to this particular scenario was uh, to go back in to take a look at that adhesive formula and reformulate and uh, look at some different ratios to improve the hot tack strength or hot tack characteristics of that he adhesive. So at the end of the day, think it back to what Rick said and what he was talking about with the different ingredients that are at play, polymers and, and waxes and resins. Um, it was a rebalancing act there to improve the hot tack um, characteristics of that adhesive, and it solved the problem. And that picture on the right kind of shows the resulting um, more robust package with no, no hot tack issues at all. Uh, this next case study would relate to sterilizer creep. So again, it's another form fill seal application, and it's uh, a scenario where materials had been used for many, many years successfully. Um, this device manufacturer um, validated a new EO cycle that was more aggressive, um, had much uh, stronger vacuums and so forth. Um, and they validated it successfully, but then realized over time they were getting a low occurrence rate of, of seal creep problems coming out of the sterilizer. Pictures kind of depict that with um, dye penetration testing and so forth. Um, so uh, we got involved, and again, back to Rick's comments, we 
we had formulated an adhesive or, or selected an adhesive that had superior creep resistance. So performed very well in that creep test we just saw a video of, um, maintained its strength at high temperature or elevated temperature, um, much more so than some of the other adhesives we benchmarked against. So we put that one in play and it resolved the issue and solved the problem. So just an example of the things that can go on, the, the types of risks that folks are dealing with, and then how your material selection process can really uh, also help drive risk out of, out of your package system and, and uh, help you in that regard. So I'm going to turn it back over to Daphne for a question and answer. Thank you, Kevin. Um, before we begin our Q&A, uh, just a few quick housekeeping items. Um, the presentation is available for download. We ask that you refresh your screen and then hit download for the slides. Also, we do have a webinar survey um, that we'd like for you to complete before leaving us today. Um, and you can access that on the right of the presentation window. If you close the survey, you can always reopen the widget by clicking on the icon along the bottom of your screen. Thank you in advance for filling out the form. Your participation in this survey allows us to serve you better. Now, on to our Q&A portion. Um, as a reminder, to participate in the Q&A, just type your question into the text box located to the right of the presentation window, or click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. If we are not able to answer all submitted questions today, um, we will be following up after the event. So on to our questions. Um, Kevin, um, here's a question. I read that adhesive coating can level the playing field. What exactly does that mean? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's, that's a great question. And um, re really the answer there is that uh, if you think about some of the things we talked about, you, you think about sealing processes, um, in my experience, a, having a coating available can, can be a little more forgiving in a sealing process. So if you think about variation in sealing, um, perhaps temperature across the seal platen, or levelness of the seal platen, or variation in thickness in different substrates that you're trying to seal, um, the ad that adhesive layer can help um, even things out and help the process to be more forgiving um, and easier to work with, if you will. And that, that's kind of, I think, what we're, we're talking about when, it, when you talk about leveling the playing field. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, also, um, Kevin, can you elaborate on what cold shock is? And um, is there an adhesive that is better for cold shock? Yeah, that's another great question we get a lot. Um, cold shock, in my experience, is a pretty rare, rare event. But um, essentially what, what happens, and in my experience, I, I see it happen most frequently um, with rigid thermoform tray and, and lid combination. So um, cold shock would relate to um, a shock that's imparted on, on the package at very cold temperatures, you know, negative 20 C, negative 30 C, and um, a cold shock failure would be um, that seal failing and, and the, the adhesive is being so brittle that they shear, or, or the it's be, temperature is being so cold that the adhesives get a little brittle and they can shear and release from the tray and create an open seal. So that's what we would call a cold shock failure. So it's a combination of very cold temperatures um, with, a, with a lot of shock, and then typically with a rigid type of package. Um, typically don't see this with flexible pouches and flexible form fill seal packages. Um, again, in my experience, 25 years in the industry, it's, it's a pretty rare event, but um, that's where we see it happen. Um, I, I think, you know, we, we, we do testing, we do cold shock testing on different adhesives, and um, there are some adhesives that perform better than others. Um, you know, if someone has a specific need, they can contact us and we can walk through what different options they have. But um, gener generally, there are some adhesives with different um, chemistries in them that Rick might be able to speak to that, that would drive um, a little bit more robustness at cold temperatures. Um, but it, that gets, you know, gets to be a little bit bigger discussion. So hopefully that helps. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and as a reminder, you may pose questions 
by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen or in the uh, text box located to the right of the presentation window. Um, Kevin, when is water-based adhesive or hot melt better? Uh, you know, that, you know I, I go out and I talk uh, to customers a lot. That's a very common question. And the, the short answer is that, you know, both have been used successfully for sterile barrier packaging for probably 40 years. Um, going back to the inception of, of DuPont Tyvek is kind of one time frame. So, um, but there are there's subtle differences. So depending on the application, I mean, I, I would kind of say rough rule of thumb, you know, 95% of applications, either one will work. It's more of a user preference thing because they're just different and they behave different. But for certain scenarios, there might be, you know, one versus the other. Um, the hot melt coating, if you look at those dots, um, are typically more porous. Um, there's more open area on the on the substrate. So if you've got a an aggressive EO cycle or you, for some reason you want really good porosity, you know, I would say let's go look at a hot melt um, type of coating technology. Um, if you, um, you know, if you had a scenario where, you know, you were having uh, problems with cold shock like we talked about a minute ago, I think we've got some really high performing water-based adhesives that would um, perform the best with a, with a rigorous or a problematic cold shock scenario. So, you know, that's a, an area we might go with, with that. But um, generally, they're, you know, they're, they're both good. Um, another way to look at it, the hot melt coatings, they're dot coated. So um, they're, they kind of um, give you some feedback from your sealing process. So you're getting those dots to merge together when you hit it with heat and, and uh, well and pressure. So um, if you've got something wrong with your sealing process, it kind of, I call it smart technology, will show you areas where the dots aren't fully merged and that can give you some, some instant feedback. On the flip side, the water-based coating, because it's a flood coating, um, you know, it can be pretty forgiving with respect to cosmetic looks of seals because you're not having to get those dots to merge together. So, um, you know, it's kind of a, it goes back to that user preference thing. And I, I, I talk to engineers all the time and they, they love one or the other, but it's, it's kind of based on just user preference. So hopefully that helps. Thank you. Um, Kevin, can you um, say whether Overseal or transparentization is bad? Whether oversealing or transparentization is bad? Um, well, it's, it's typically, you know, I'll speak in general terms, but um, when you overseal, and let's say you're working with Tyvek, um, Tyvek is made out of HDPE. If you're oversealing it and you're getting it to turn transparent, that means you're melting the fibers of the Tyvek and you're getting them to look kind of clear. So we would... Uh, generally try to steer our customers away from that scenario. Um, I'm, I'm not going to say that it results in a in a breach of sterile barrier because I don't really think that's the case. It's it typically is cosmetic, um, and it can um, you know if you're overdoing it, you can you can it can help or or lead to more problems with respect to tearing or delamination of the substrates. So for that reason, you know we we try to get folks away from that scenario. But I'm but I'm, I'm not going to say that it's a breach of sterile barrier necessarily. Okay, thank you. Um, Rick, for water-based coating, how can you control or improve porosity? Well, there's a lot of formulation details that go into the resulting porosity. The sort of ratio of the ingredients um, is critical, but there's a, another thing, and that's part of our process, which uh, controls the, um, the particle size distribution of the dispersion is important. So we also control that uh, in a certain way to, we can control that to improve porosity. Um, there's a certain limit to how much you can, you can do, but, um, and also um, porosity, the things you do to improve porosity can also affect other properties like strength and so forth. So it's 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 always a balancing act. But uh, um, yes, there there are uh, formulation approaches that you can improve it. Um, and and Rick, do you have issues with the water-based adhesive and bubble testing? Um, the, a lot of people think that water-based adhesives means they're water-soluble. Um, they're not. These are dispersion materials. Um, 
they they're insoluble in water. They have they're in distinct particles uh, or small small domains in the, in the water. Um, so and they are very very similar to the hot melts in that they are insoluble, very insoluble in water. So fundamentally, um, they're they're you know water would n not affect them. But there is um, there is it, it's more about the interface, how robust the seal, uh, the, the interface between the coating and whatever you're bonding it to, and that, that, can be, that can be important. So in certain cases, if the bonding is not as robust um, with regard, that can be exposed sort of by, by moisture. So in, there are certain cases where we could have difficulty with a bubble test. Um, but in general, uh, in general, not not necessarily. Um, so it's it's usually specific cases. Thanks, Rick. Um, Kevin, um, in the bow tie test, are you using a single spring value and only measuring seal retention? Um, this person says that uh, they've seen that the test done in the 70s uh, with force as the measure using a range of spring values? Yeah, we're, we're basically just using a single uh, spring value and measuring seal retention only. That's, like I said, it's not, it's not been really um, put together as a pass-fail um, or, you know, driving data. It's, it's more about using a single, single value, single force value, and then um, using that to rank different adhesives and material combinations. Um, and that's the way we've been looking at it t to date. So. Okay, thank you. Um, and Kevin, um, we have a request. Um, can you repeat the answer for hot melt versus water-based adhesive for paper substrate? Hot melt versus water-based for paper substrate. So, um, yeah, I think it's it's a lot of the same things in play. Um, you know, think about that dot coat pattern and, you know, breathability um, with respect to paper. So uh, paper is porous. Um, different, different grades of paper have different levels of, of, levels of porosity. So uh, it goes back to the kind of the same situation I talked about earlier with um, dot being more breathable versus a water base, which is, uh, that is flood coated. Um, pros and cons there also relate to um, forgivingness in, this, in the sealing process. So if you've got a flood coat, it can be generally very easy to work with. You're not having to get those dots of adhesive to activate, flow, and merge together to create, to create a cosmetically good-looking seal. Um, so those are the kinds of things we, we look at. But again, generally they've been used both for paper for, for many years successfully for sterile barrier applications. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, can either of you address um, whether the peelable seal specs is a one pound per inch minimum? Well, that's that's a. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the question is, but it's it's a very common or it's a it's a topic of discussion in our industry right now. Um, it has been for years, but it's being um, Someone that works in our company, Jeff Pavey, is kind of attacking this. So the rule of thumb historically for many folks has been we need a one-pound minimum. So many of the adhesive combinations are formulated to kind of get at that level, um, one pound. But there's not a lot of documentation showing why why is it one pound? Why is that a common rule of thumb? It's not a it's not an industry standard. It's just an industry rule of thumb that's very commonly used. So. Um, so there's there's more news to come on that. Jeff P Pavey is actually leading uh, a team um, to try to get at that and, and help put together standards for um, or guidance around developing what your seal strength minimum requirement should be. Um, I, I hope that answers the question because it was kind of a, a general question, but um, there's a lot of activity going on in, in that particular arena. So more, more news to come in the future. Okay, great. I'll definitely stay tuned. Um, another question regarding cold shock. Um, Kevin, at what temperature is the cold shock test done? 
Well, we, we do we do cold shock testing at, at different temperatures. It's n it's not a set standard around that. So uh, we will often look starting at zero C, negative 10, negative 20, negative 30. Um, sometimes it's driven by uh, our customers who have a particular concern about a particular region of the world where they they've measured temperatures at at various uh, lows. So it's it's more about that than than and less about actual you know, having a standard test method around it. But co commonly, you know, those ranges, that's where we're looking. Just, and again, it's about ranking materials, and we're doing um, different things to try to put shock in, on, a, on a seal and, and see what happens. So, um, you know, if someone's interested in that, they can reach out, and we can talk more about what we do and how we measure things. Okay, great. Um, are there products that can minimize plasticizer? I'll take a shot at that one. Um, well, as far as the, in the coating goes, we're not generally using plasticizers in the formulation. So plasticizer comes into effect more in the films or the substrates. Um, uh, Tyvek doesn't use plasticizer. I think it's more in the films where plasticizer can be used. And then you can see in some cases where uh, sealing could change if, uh, over time, if plasticizer comes to the surface, um, really, it, so it kind of gets to the film manufacturers. It's really kind of out of our, our hands, except that, excuse me, we will do, we do do for products uh, and combinations, we will do, um, you know, aging tests and uh, to see uh, if, if things hold up over time. Um, but and we also try to you know can work with our suppliers to try to minimize their. In some cases, we've had to tell them to you know take out uh, certain certain materials that are causing us trouble. Okay, thank you, um, Kevin or Rick. Uh, what do you foresee as the possible failure modes if a customer were to reseal a lid, essentially seal a lid onto a tray, remove the lid? and reseal a second lid. Well, maybe this is Kevin, maybe I'll start and Rick you can chime in, but I I've I've had that question before. Um I've had I've had customers ask about that exact same scenario and they've done some testing um and and really, you know, I, I think it's possible to do that. Um I ha we haven't tested that extensively because it's a it's a rare rare question, so we're generally thinking about making a seal once, peeling it once, and then it's disposed of. So we haven't done a lot of research in that area. I think in general, um, you know, my concern would be, you know, if you're doing that, what, are you changing um, the amount of adhesive at that interface somehow by sealing it a second time? Is it going to be a less less robust seal? Um, you know, it may look good or, or test good, or, or, you know, initially, but is it going to be as robust when it's exposed to um, shock vibration, temperature extremes, et cetera, during your sterilization and transportation cycles. And I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Rick, or not, but that, that's how I would answer it. Yeah, I think in general you're, you're opening up some possibilities of risk that uh, we don't have a lot of information on yet. Because it, when you peel it off, you're going to have some adhesive transfer, um, and then when you put another tray down, you're basically having a thicker layer of adhesive um, and so, are you getting the right flow and um, and and that kind of thing? And then, as Kevin said, you know, could affect the properties uh, at elevated temperature during sterilization by having that thicker layer. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Kevin, during accelerated aging, should humidity be used, um, and does it affect the seal on Tyvek? Well, generally, um, humidity is not going to impact Tyvek. Um, I think I think most folks would at least monitor humidity during during their accelerated aging testing, but um, generally it, it wouldn't have a huge impact unless it's you know really extreme. And you know, Rick, you might want to chime in as well with your experience from a, from a chemistry standpoint. Uh, we, usually, we don't control humidity for accelerated aging. We kind of let that go uh, as at ambient um, 
for you know at natural humidity. Um, so that's not generally a part of ours. But as Kevin said, yeah, for Tyvek specifically, uh, very unaffected high density polyethylene, very unaffected by humidity. Um, you know, paper would be another issue. Yeah. Okay. Thank you both. Um, that's all the time we have for questions today. Um, if we didn't get to your question, we'll be following up after the event. Um, thank you, Kevin and Rick, very much for your time and your expertise today. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Oliver Healthcare Packaging, as well as everyone in our audience. We appreciate your attention and your participation. Within the next 24 hours, you will receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to the presentation on demand. Please feel free to invite your colleagues and peers who may not have been available to listen to the event. This webinar is copyright 2017 by UBM. The presentation materials are owned and copyrighted by Packaging Digest and Oliver Healthcare Packaging. And the individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and their opinions. Thanks for your time and have a great day.